though after my sin were destroyed his body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reign be consumed within me. Might we bow for a word of prayer? Heavenly and Holy Father, we come to you thanking you, Lord, for allowing us to have an opportunity to go and be with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your son came, lived, died, was resurrected, and rose up on the third day, and now sits on the right hand of God, making intercession for all of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you made a way for us to come to you and to be with you. When we leave this earthly tabernacle, we have another home not made by hands. And we thank you so much. Now, Lord, we ask that you'll bless the service and that you'll bless the family, Heavenly Father, as we go through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, we, because of uh, the limitations of COVID-19, we will have now uh, the military honors first, and then we will proceed with the service.
those who can, we ask to please stand for the playing of taps. God bless. Certainly on today, this is a day that we had not expected to be here. Certainly on today is a day of sadness and yet with uplift because of the fact we know where our brother is. At this time, we're going to ask uh, Deacon Mona Atkins Easley to come and read the Old Testament. Deacon Paula Matthews to come to read the New Testament and the prayer of comfort will be given by Reverend Vance Jones in that order. Good afternoon. I will be reading Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 14, a time for everything. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away. God does it so that people will fear. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before. And God will call the past to account. The word of God for the people of God.
Good afternoon. I'm reading from John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know the way, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. May God add a reading to the blessing of his word. I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone here. To everyone under the sound of my voice, there's a resurrection that we embrace. That resurrection was because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. We're here today to celebrate and witness a home going of one of our loved ones and friends. A young man that was a community man, I call it. He did everything in service that he could for the Lord. William was the kind of person that didn't have any enemies. He made friends wherever he went. I watched him on Sunday mornings and I come to teach Sunday school. He'd always had the doors open. The building in the, in the winter time, he had the heat on. In the summer, he had the air conditioning on. And he'd always have his infamous pot of coffee on the, on the table. And sometimes I'd tell him, I said, William, this is a little too strong this morning, son. <laughs> but William had a wit about him. He loved people. We're going to miss William. We're going to miss William. This church is going to miss William. It's hard to replace a servant, a true servant. He was dedicated. To the family today before I pray, Jerry, Brian, Brandon, the grandchildren, brothers, sisters, friends, and family. We have an obligation as believers to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior while we still have blood running warm in our veins. There's going to come a time for all of us to be right here. But we need to make preparations right now while we still have breath in our bodies and blood running warm in our veins. There's an opportunity today for us to just draw a little closer to God and a little closer to each other. We don't love each other enough. I can't put it no plainer than that. But Jesus Christ loved us so much that he'd go to a cross to die on a cross go to a grave for three days, conquer death, hell, and the grave that we might have life and have life eternally. You see, William's body is here, but his spirit has already gone on to be with the Lord. And if he was standing here, he would say, may the work I've done speak for me. So God, we come today to say thank you. God, we thank you for the resurrected Christ that we serve today. God bless this family. All these friends that assemble here. God, we realize that we need you in this hour. God, we realize about this pandemic that's going on. But I thank you, God, that you said in your word that if you're planted, the tree that's planted by the water, so we'll stand the heat. So God, we thank you today as we stand and we're planted by the stream of water that no weapon formed against us shall prosper because our righteousness, God, is of you. God, bless Jerry right now, God. Brandon, Brian. God, they have big shoes to fill. But you have already ordained it, the grandchildren. God, we thank you right now for blessing the brother that's left behind. Allow him, God, to see you in the midst of all that's going on. And God, you're still good no matter what we see. Because we realize, God, as believers, that death is not the end, but the beginning of a new life 
in eternity with you, God, because we love you while we were on this side of joy. God, it's the day that we can declare this a celebration because William has served you, God. He has served you, God, from, from top to bottom, from head to tail. He gave his life for you, Lord. He blessed so many people in the community. He blessed so many people. He served in the military. And God, we thank you for him, and we're going to miss him. But we realize, too, God, if we want to see William again, that we all have to get in line and walk up the King's Highway together. Because, God, we don't want to stay here. And today, bless the man's servant that's going to break the bread of life. God, allow him to speak with boldness and clarity, proclaiming the good news of his soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Because God, right now, we thank you that as we are at a crossroads in our lives, the right seems wrong and the wrong seems right. But God, I thank you right now that Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And we thank you for the blood-stained banner that's placed on the doorpost of everyone here. It's in the name of Jesus today I declare these blessings. Let the church say amen and amen again for the Holy Spirit. At this time, we'll have the hymn of consolation from Mrs. Donna London. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Certainly, I want to thank Ms. Donna Lundy for the hymn of consolation, Deacon Mona Atkins Easley for the reading of the Old Testament, and Deacon Paula Matthews for the reading of the New Testament, and Reverend Vance Jones for the prayer of comfort. We thank God for you, and we thank God for you coming and being with us on this day and on this occasion. Certainly, there have been many letters that have come, but we will not be able to read all of them. Uh, I certainly, I will say that I will be selfish and I will read the letter from St. John Baptist Church. But we cannot read all of them because we're trying to stay within a certain time limit and we thank God for your patience. We will give all the letters as well as all of the acknowledgments to the family. St. John Baptist Church, 
8131 Roxbury Road, Charles City, Virginia, 23030. December 6, 2020. Dear Jerry, Brandon, Brian, and family, our hearts have been heavy since hearing of the passing of William Henry Womack, Jr. on December the 2nd, 2020. On behalf of everyone at St. John Baptist Church, we would like to express our most sincere condolences. We know you are grieving and we are grieving along with you. William was an integral part of St. John Baptist Church. William could be found at the church on Saturday evening, adjusting the temperature to make sure it was comfortable on Sunday morning. He was one of the first faces you would see on Sunday morning, usually in the fellowship hall, drinking coffee with many of our church members, but keeping an eye on the back door to make sure everything was in order. When we instituted the change to lock the back doors and sanctuaries, 15 minutes after the start of church service, William was the one who made sure it was done. He was then in the narthex on security duty, making sure that the church and congregation were safe. In this time of great sorrow, please know that you are in our thoughts and our prayers. William has been an active member of St. John Baptist Church since joining. He served on the usher board, the men's ministry, and the board of trustees, where he served as vice chair. William was one of our go-to people. William left us suddenly. Just last first Sunday, he was here at our parking lot service carrying out his usual duties. While it hurts those left behind, we hope you can find comfort in the fact that William is, in, is with God. He will live on in our memories. The Bible gives us great assurance in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13 through 14 verses. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died rose again, and so we believe that God would bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Your St. John Baptist Church family will always be here for you. Keep your eyes on Jesus and let him sustain you during this difficult time. We are reminded in 1 Peter 5th chapter and 7th verse, cast all your anxiety and cares on him because he cares for you. We will continue to keep you in our prayers. May God give you peace that surpasseth all understanding. Lovingly submitted, Reverend Ellsworth Tate, Pastor St. John Baptist Church, Donna uh, L. Overby, Church Clerk. Amen. At this time, we will have um, reflections, and we pray that each of those that are reflecting will keep their time to two minutes each at this time. We have first Mr. Oliver Whitehead, then Mr. Thomas E. Jones III, then Mr. Clarence Jones, and then Mr. David Plyant. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> on Friday when I met with Jerry, she told me that I was on the program. I was on the program. That's the first I'd heard of it, and she said, you got two minutes. <laughs> I have tried since then to get it down to two minutes, but the best I can do is about five minutes, Jerry. So I apologize for that ahead of time. William would frequently tell me whenever he had something to do. Do you know how I got involved in this? And he said, your daddy came up to me and he said, boy, you're gonna usher. So he said, I got up and I ushered. He said, that was the beginning of me getting involved in the church and doing things. Well, I thought about how I could best describe William when he wasn't ushering and doing other things in the church. And something came to mind that I want to share with you. 
It was a commercial on TV about 35, maybe 40 years ago. And two, these two boys were sitting down with some food. And one said, I'm not going to eat that. And the second one says, I'm not eating that either. And they said, let's give it to Mikey. <laughs> He'll eat anything. <laughs> so they took it over and gave it to Mikey. Mikey ate it, and he loved it. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with William's eating habits or anything else that I know that he ate. But what it does say is that if we had something to do, give it to William. He was the church of Mikey. He would get it done. There's no doubt about it. If he couldn't do it, he would find somebody else that would do it. If they couldn't do it, he'd go and find a contractor to get it done. But William got it done. You could depend on him all the time. The next thing I want to move on is tell you about the first men's fellowship meeting we had. William decided that he was going to keep the records of who contributed to the fellowship. So he wrote down everyone's name, how much they gave, and after the meeting was over, he came over to see me. He said, I've got the money. Count it. Okay, William. He said, uh, here it is. Put it in the treasure. Then he hands me a piece of paper. So what's that, William? He said, you're going to sign this to say you got the money. <laughs> I, said, I said, okay. I, I'll do that, no problem. But that illustrates another point I want to bring up, and that is when it comes to spending church money, William knew what he had spent and what was being spent. He had this book, and he wrote down in it the day, what was done, who I gave it to, and how much it was. And it was never a question about any money that William had to handle. And when the, con when the contractor's invoice came in, it was exactly to the penny of what William told him it was going to be. So the last church men's fellowship meeting we had was last January. Of course, William kept the paperwork and all that. And of all the things that we had gone through in the last 15 years handling money, and William knew that I was straight with him and he was straight with me. He come over to bring me the money and guess what he handed me? That piece of paper. He said, sign it to show that you received the money. He didn't, he didn't play with the church money. He kept good tabs. Finally, William did everything that you had asked him to do except one. And that was his last task. And that was to get a parking lot paved. So when the trustees were told that we now have enough money because we have paid the mortgage, we're ready to get our parking lot paved. And William said, I'll do it. I'll lead it. Governor Vance Jones said, I'll help you. And I said, I'll help too, William. So William went out and got all the paperwork, con uh, not the contracts, but the estimates and everything else. And he came back and he said, now let's decide who's going to do it. I said, okay, William, what do you recommend? You met these people. He said, I recommend this one. I said, all right, that's good. Let's go for it. He said, the other thing I want you to do is, he said, I want you to present the information to the trustees and to the church. Okay, William, I have no problem. I'll do that. So after two weeks passed, I said, William, where's the contract? I need to review the contract before the church meeting, which is going to be the week after next, and I need to know everything he's going to do. William said, well, this is what happened. I called this guy four times. Three times he promised me on a certain day he would have the contract. The last time I called him, he said, You'll get it next week. We didn't say he lives in Hopewell. What's his problem? He said, I'll tell you what. He's not going to do nothing here. He's not even going to come here. We don't want him. All right, William, who's the next one? Okay, this is the guy. 
He said, okay. That was on Sunday. Monday afternoon, William called me. He said, the contract is going to meet us at the church tomorrow to bring the contract. And I said, okay, good. So he came, and I told him a few things that else we wanted done. And I said, are you going to charge us any more for doing these? He said, no. He said, this is the contract. So I said, William, well, how come you chose the other guy first? He said, because he was $2,000 cheaper than the one I'm getting now. He said, but he called me last week, and he said, I'm going to cut the estimate down $1,000. I said, okay, I'd rather pay an extra 1000 and get a good job than pay this guy who's on the album. So the contractor said, so we told him it would be about a week and a half before we get the contract, and then uh, we would send it over to him, and he said it would be about three weeks after that we'd get the parking lot paid. I said, okay, we, we can work with that. So I found out that William was hospitalized and it was ill. So I called the contractor. I said, look, uh, in fact, I left him a message. Didn't get him. He didn't call me that day. Next day, bright and early, sunrise, he's calling. Oh, Mr. Womack, I am so sorry. I couldn't get a hold of you yesterday. I didn't get the message until real late. I said, uh, you're talking to Whitehead. He said, oh, yeah, I see it down here. I said, uh, I just got two things I want to tell you. When are you going to pay the parking lot? He said, well, here's the story. He said, it's been raining so much that I'm behind on my work. He said, I can't possibly get it done until after Thanksgiving. He said, then I can't give you the quality job I want to do because it's too cold. He said, okay. I said, okay. He said, so my best thing to, that I can do is do it next spring. I said, okay, I appreciate it. He said, but this is what I want to do. I want to cancel the contract because I can't do it when I promised you I was going to do it. I said, no, we want you. We've decided on you. He said, okay. The second thing I told him, I said, Mr. Womack is ill. He's in the hospital. He said, oh, my goodness, I hope he gets well. And the last thing he left me with, he said, I'll be praying for Mr. Womack that he recovers. And I knew then that, that I was the, the right man. But I tell you all that to get to the bottom line. When it comes to doing church business, William was all business. He didn't take no stuff. He was the nicest guy you want to see. But don't mess with his money and don't mess with the church. He, he didn't tolerate that. So I said to you, Jerry, I know I took a little more time than I should have, but I think people should know the William that I knew. And I worked with him for over 20 years. And we always got along fine. So I said, God bless you. And finally, from the trustees, I tell you that we have really lost a willing worker and it has been bad. But if anything that we can do, as far as the trustees, you let me know. You let me know. And it'll be taken care of. And I know you've already given us one request and I've done some work on it and I've given you some feedback but I'm still working on it and I'll get it done. So God bless you and take care. I'm sorry I took that long. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the Womack family for giving William to us for over 40 years. We really appreciate that. William was never considered an outsider. He always fit right in. When he first came to Charles City to court my sister, he used to stay at my house. 
And that would go on and on. And I said, you know something? I think William's going to be here to stay. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> William fit right into the family. He not only fit into the family, he fit into the church, the community. Like he had been raised in Charles City, County. Some people thought he was actually was born and raised in Charles City. And uh, we always admired the way he opened up his home to the entire family and to his friends and anyone else in the community. His faith, his family values meant a lot to him. His work ethics were phenomenal. Everything had to be in place. He told me one time, he said, Tom, you know, I think I'm going to give up this job. Well, I couldn't say I agree with it because I didn't want him to give it up. So he, somewhere down the line, he called his cousin Maurice and uh, Prince Edward. Maurice said, William, when you are or ordained to do a job, you let God take you out of that job. You don't quit it. I never heard William complain or say he was going to give that job up anymore. And I'm going to tell you what. You can re replace him, but you can't replace all that he's done. Uh, Jerry, like you say, it wasn't a part of the kitchen ministry, but I'd go to him and try to find, find stuff. He knew where everything was. And we worked just like a fine-tuned instrument. He fit right in, and, and you know, uh, and he was with us through the good times and the bad times. He always would lend a hand in whatever was going on. We will be of indebted to him for all that he contributed to the family. Our circle has again been reduced. William knew the importance and the value of family, Jerry, Larry, Brandon, and Brian. William loved you and so did we, and so do us. And so does the family, let me put it like that. Anyway. <laughs> He will be missed, but he left us something more valuable than silver or gold. His precious memories. Now, I don't need to pay. I'm not going to say goodbye, because bye is final. I'm going to say, William, I'm going to see you later. And he said, you have already heard the words I'm, I want to hear. Well done, that good and faithful servant. You just heard them before I did. That's all. And we're all of us. But buddy, I'm going to miss you. And I'm going to be there for your family. And if anything you all ever need, just remember. I'm here, and everyone else it will be here for you also. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My condolences go out to the Warmack family, Jerry, Brandon, Brian and the family, our hearts go out to you in your time of sorrow. God's word tell us the Lord is our refuge for the oppressed, a strong hold in time of trouble. William and I worked together for about, let's say about 10 years, but I knew him for about 15 because he was working in another section and then t uh, later on he worked with us. Um, 
William loved the Lord. I guess you want to say, how do I know that? Because we discuss the Lord and how the Holy Spirit works. Uh, I enjoy, you know, just talking to William. And he enjoyed listening. He loved his wife, Jerry. He always used to talk about Jerry does, Jerry does, Jerry does. <laughs> uh, so he loved his wife. He loved his children, Brian, uh, Brian, Brandon, and the family. His grandchildren, he used to talk about his grandchildren. He loved his church, he used to talk about St. John all the time. St. John this and St. John that. So he loved his church. William was a people person. He loved people. William loved life. He was full of fun. William loved to serve in any capacity that was needed. He was always there to encourage you. William was a committed and accountable worker. He was always on the job, always working. William also loved to fry fish for all different occasions at Bellwood. Whenever somebody needed fish fry, you know, they would ask uh, Womack. Womack said, okay. He loved, he used to talk about hunting all the time. He used to talk about fishing. He also used to talk about, you know, when he was a football coach. Uh, it's a scripture uh, that I'm reminded of. Romans 8, 38, and 39. And it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor death, for anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I believe Warmack knew that, and he believed that. So to the family, because I'm going to make my comments short, just remember, the light of God will surround us. The love of God will enfold us. The power of God will protect us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. So just keep your hands in God's hands and you'll be okay. Uh, if you ever need anything uh, that I can help with, just give Diggin' Jones a call. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a little nervous, so I'll ask for your indulgence and patience with me. Uh, my name is David, and this is Mary. And uh, I've just mentioned uh, once I, I made a speech, a very important speech. And I was so nervous, I got up and I said, uh, good ladies, afternoon, and gentlemen. And from that point forward, I said, that's it. I'm writing everything down. Uh, and so I have some comments. I'll partly speak from my heart and from my notes. Mary and I met William and Jerry 15 years ago. And the sun would be shining, so I can't see my screen. We met them about 15 years ago when I had retired from the Air Force and moved back to my hometown in North Carolina. William also proud, served proudly in the Air Force, but our paths never crossed while we were on active duty. 
Our lifelong friendship began through Mary and Jerry, who were co-workers at Bellwood, but really didn't know each other. Jerry, and I kind of consider her as a person who never meets a stranger, she invited us to a cookout at her home, and we had a wonderful time. All the food was delicious. We met a lot of friendly people from Charles City, and the Womax hospitality was truly amazing. Their family members, friends, and church family welcomed us with open arms. And that bond still exists today. William and I quickly became the best of friends. He treated Mary and me like we were members of his own family. He was so kind and so genuine. Whenever we would visit, he'd always say to me, Ted Dave, kick back and relax. Make yourself at home. With him, the deal was always mi casa, su casa. Since then, we've been to numerous other cookouts at his home, and we've enjoyed several crews and beach vacations. We celebrated special occasions like birthdays, the 4th of July. We've worshiped here at St. John Baptist Church when we could. I was honored to reciprocate the hospitality on several occasions when William and Jerry visited my home in Lincolnton, North Carolina, which is about 25 miles from Charlotte. During those visits, we had a great, wonderful time. Uh, we did everything and nothing. We, we just hung out because we enjoyed each other's company so much. Well, we went to Aldi's and we went to Worldwide Imports, which Jerry liked to go to, and we went to Lincoln Seafood, all the typical things that citizens of Lincolnton do. And Jerry and William fit right in to my hometown, and they're somewhat legends in Lincoln. Everybody knows them. <laughs> Over the years, the Womax host over the years, the Womack hosted uh, almost all of my family for an epic family reunion type cookout at their home. Because I have nine brothers and sisters, and all of them don't, don't live in Lincolnton. Some live in New York, some live in Georgia. But they've met them all. And this was an epic event. And William and Jerry so graciously uh, invited my family there and I mean, we really just, we had a, a wonderful time. Um, in, in my notes here, it says it's almost like going to the World's Fair. And, and I'm not just saying that, it really, really was. Uh, my family still talks about it to this day. Uh, my friends in Lincoln, they say, well Dave, when are you going back to, to uh, Richmond, to Charles City? Everybody wants to come to William and Jerry's house. And that, that's true. My friend Bo, my friend Terry, uh, Billy and his girlfriend came and they had a good time. They danced. They, they just had a wonderful time. So people in Lincoln think Charles City and the Womacks are, are, are really something. Don't you agree? Yes. Um, there are so many accolades and attributes that made William an exceptional person he was. And Tommy talked about him. He, he mentioned yesterday that William is irreplaceable, or the things that he did were irreplaceable. Uh, I read on comments online uh, that his, his uh, niece said that he was the fun uncle, and that's the way she remembered him. And all the comments that I read online were relevant and, and uh, actually describe William. The way I saw him, he, he was irreplaceable. He dependable, loyal, smart. He was smart like Samson. He was a God-fearing man like Joshua, and he set the example for his family. He was a loving husband, and he, and he had really good taste too. He, he picked Jerry as his wife, and he loved her with all of his heart and soul. He was an awesome father and granddad. And he was very proud of his son, Brandon, and Brian, 
and he, he was so proud of his, his grandchildren, um, Jalil and Johnny. He tried not to brag too much, but it was written all over his face. He didn't really have to say a word, but you could always tell that he had so much love for his grandchildren and, and his children as well. He was a great brother. He was a wonderful in-law. His, his in-laws loved him, like Tommy said. They, they took him in just like one of their own family members. And you don't, you don't find that these days that often. You know, sometimes, you know, I forgot whether it, William was a Womack or a Jones, that they were just that close. Again, he was a great friend, and he was loyal, dependable, um, trustworthy, honest, and all the wonderful things that you could say about a person, that's what William was. And I don't say these things, or Tommy doesn't say these things, or Mr. Whitehead doesn't say these things, just because it's the right thing to say, and it's something good to say about a person. But we say them because they're really, really true, and we mean that from the bottom of our hearts. I'm, I'm really gonna miss William. I loved him. Mary's gonna mi miss him. She loved him as well. And William used to always like to refer to me as, as Colonel because he was proud of me too, just like his his own family. And uh, you know, I thought that was you know really nice. But he, we were down to earth, just good friends. And so at this point, I'd like to say I'm really gonna miss him. I want him to rest in peace. And at this point, I would just I'm not gonna say goodbye. But in the military, there's a saying we say, uh, fair winds and following seas. And it's implied that we will meet again. In this case, we will meet again. At this point, I would just like to salute my friend, William Womack. Thank you. Certainly, as we come to this part of the worship, we would like to thank Mr. Oliver Whitehead, Mr. Thomas E. Jones III, Mr. Clarence Jones, and Mr. David and Mary. Uh, we thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Uh, at this time, we have um, a musical selection by Mr. Alan White. Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. In the midst of everything you're going through, it's still a good afternoon. We ought to be able to say, thank you, Lord, not for the death, but for the life that was lived and the legacy that's been left within the family. There were several things I wanted to say before I got up here, but other folks have taken up time. So the only thing I do want to say is that I'm grateful for meeting Womack when I did. Met him a few years back and he's just been a constant bright spot anytime I got to speak with him and I'm grateful for that. I truly am and we'll miss him here and miss him in general. But to the family, I got my orders from Miss Jerry and what I had to play, I'm going to do it for you. But just know that Womack, he may be absent from down here but he's just taking a closer walk with the Lord and we're grateful for that.
Walk with me one more time. Come on now. Sleep on, brother woman. Thank you, brother White. I think if I keep asking him, one day he'll teach me how to play that thing. We thank you so much. We thank God so much for the life of Brother Womack. He never met a stranger. He's always a good friend. Uh, I know that at one point, Brother Womack and I, we were talking, and he wanted me to join the Hunt Club with him. And I was excited. I, I, I didn't have a gun. And I, you know, I, I hadn't shot one either. Not a shotgun anyway. And I told, I told him, he said, well, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. He, he said, uh, he was talking about uh, his son might have, a, what was it, 870 or something. What, something he was talking about. And uh, I said, okay, all right. So we started talking back and forth. He said, well, there's an initiation that you have to go through. And I, I said, oh, okay, all right, what's the initiation? He said, he told me, he said, well, you have to put on a hat with antlers on it. And then you have to run through the woods. <laughs> And, and, and if you don't get shot, <laughs> you're into the hunt club. <laughs> and, and that was just how, how we, <laughs> that's just how we were time and time again. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. And I, I say he is a great guy because I don't believe in um, the fact that someone has passed from this place, we know that he's passed, but we know where he's at. And he's more alive now than he has ever been in his life. And that is that in itself is hard, hard, very hard to believe. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm going to um, tell, the, tell, try to tell his story a little bit. Some things that you know and some things that you don't know about him and how I think he was living uh, in his life. Uh, and I, I would say to you, if you want a scripture reference, it will come from Luke, the ninth chapter, the, the 60, 62nd verse. And it is a verse that Jesus spoke when he said, no one having had their hands on a plow and looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. And because I, I said this to my, my daughter, and my daughter asked me what a plow is, I'm going to say no one who has said to God that, that took Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. Womack was a great guy. And we know one thing, that this eulogy is difficult. No one could have told me that I would be here eulogizing my friend and our brother. But one thing we can say, Womack wasn't one 
to look back. He wasn't one to put his hands on a job and leave it undone. As I began to frame his life, I would say that I'm going to borrow from my cousin, God rest his soul, who would always show up at funerals and say that life is like a football game. There are four quarters in a football game and there are four quarters in life. Womack and I used to talk about that sometimes and I'm going to use that analogy here. However, I'm not going to go any further than the first quarter because if life is like a football game, I believe Womack learned everything he needed to know in the first quarter. And if I was to give you, were to give you the position that he played, it would be the position where he won the most accolades. No, it wasn't being the quarterback. No, it wasn't being uh, the, a wide receiver. No, it was being the center. Because in the center, Womack had a job that was integral to the success of the team. Being a center meant that every time he hiked the ball, he would get hit. <laughs> Being a center meant that every time he hiked the ball, he would face the opposing team head on. Being a center meant that sometimes he would hit, get hit and fall, but then he would have to get up and go back to the line of scrimmage one more time to face the opposition. The center snaps, starts the whole play. And one of the things that happens is that we know about the quarterbacks, but not too many people know about the center. In other words, there are times if the center does something wrong, that is the only time that you know about the center. Every single time he gets hit, every single time he has to go back to the line, Every single time he has to decide if he will stand or fall. And every single time he has to protect the ball as well as the quarterback. If life is like a football game divided into four quarters, I would say emphatically that everything Wolbeck needed to learn was contained in the first quarter. First quarter is when you find out who the opposing team is as well as who you are. And Womack had a lot in his corner when he started his life. He was born and raised in Prince Edward County. And being there, he was born to uh, Mr. Henry, Mr. William Henry and Josephine uh, Womack. He had one brother, Larry, and they were living there and having a great time because their family was there, much like the people here in Charles City. He had very prominent members in his family. The family boasted Reverend Dr. Vernon Johns, who was the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. He was the predecessor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Also, his cousin Barbara Johns uh, led a uh, led a school boycott, which eventually became part of Broad, Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit, which desegregated the schools throughout the nation. But I want to say that at this point in his life. Womack was hit and he was knocked down. Because in the 50s and the 60s, 
Little black boys and little black girls were given inferior materials and interior buildings, inferior buildings. But that didn't stop him from continuing to learn because though they had inferior materials and inferior buildings, they had superior teachers that taught more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. They taught life skills and the willingness for them to go forth and do the best that they can. Womack was hit and knocked down again. In the obituary, it reads, it says that he attended elementary school in Prince Edward County for three years and then went to Petersburg. But that doesn't tell the whole story. In June 1959, the Prince Edward County Board of Supervisors voted not to fund public schools. This meant that all of the African American children that attended public schools didn't have anywhere to get their education from for five years. The white schools, white persons, were they, they, they voted and they went on to um, privatize white education in that county where African Americans didn't have any place to go. Mr. and Mrs. Womack showed William and Larry how to stand up. They brought them to Petersburg to get the education they deserve. They was hit again because they left a community where they were well known and well loved to come to Petersburg because people in Prince Edward County didn't believe black and white should go to school together. This place Womack back a year, but it didn't stop him. It did not slow him down. Womack told me this himself. He said he, he, he knocked himself down this time himself. He told me that he began to go for bad. No one could tell him what he could do. Nobody could control him. Nobody could tell him what he needed to do or what he came with. He would come when he wanted to come and go when he, he told me this. Was, I was like, oh my goodness. But his mother talked to a man in the community. You remember there were, used to be men in the community that could get folk together. This man was named Coach Willis. If you don't know it, Coach Willis was the only real live person that I have ever seen or known. I, did, I didn't know him. I, I, I knew him from afar. He was a 10th degree black belt. Fought all over the world. And William, if William thought he was going to be bad, guess what? <laughs> he was put into the country honorably. Not only that, but after the Air Force, or uh, sometime after that, and he found his precious. He found his Jerry. They were two peas in a pod. Then they had two boys, which made them four peas in a pod. <laughs> By age 25, his first quarter, he had learned what he needed for life. That when you get pushed down, when you get knocked down, get back up and continue. He learned how to work. He knew that there was an opposing team. He learned the value of family. He learned that things didn't always work out. He learned that some people wouldn't like him because of the color of his skin. He learned that tough times don't laugh, last, but tough people do. But wait a minute, did I tell you that Womack liked to have fun also? Think about him, about Womack and Jerry. They love to have fun, and, but the thing about them that was different was they loved to see other people have fun. So he would organize these, these, these events and start feeding people. First time I went to their house, they had something called rockfish. 
I never had fish with gravy on it and onions. And the rockfish and gravy was so good, I told Womack if he wasn't so big, I would hit him. <laughs> then they started talking about catfish and, and, and gravy. I was like, gravy with fish? It just didn't seem that it worked out. But when I ate at the table, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Woo! They would feed people and then organize trips. Here you're going to pig festivals and going on vacation and feeding people and then going fishing. And I, I went with them fishing once, once or twice and, it, you know, I, they, they tried to laugh at me because I got about three fish <laughs> and a crab. But I told them that if, if Jesus could feed 5,000 <laughs> with two fish and, and five loaves of bread, they certainly ought to be able to feed my family with those three fish. <laughs> they love to feed people. They love to entertain people. They love to make people laugh. They love to, to make sure that you felt comfortable in their home. And every now and then, about every Sunday, he would tell me about his sons, about what they were doing, because he was so very proud of the life that they were living. Well, did I tell you that he loved the Lord? One of the things that, that makes this bearable is the fact that Womack believed in Jesus Christ. Now, now, when we were coming up, I, I, I understand it. We, we were made to go to church, but there's something that happens between the time that we were made to go to church and we went and got baptized and all of that. There's something that happens to us that we began to actually believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And not only that, that we can take Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. He learned how. And I told him, I said, well, we're not praying about that. We're praying for full healing. We're praying that you will get up from your bed of affliction and be able to come back to St. John Baptist Church and stand in the congregation and tell about the wonders of God. And certainly the family and I, we went, we, we, we prayed and some days it was good and some days it wasn't so good. Some days we were shouting hallelujah, other times we were in tears. Sometimes we heard good news and then there were other times that we didn't hear such good news. And so the, the testimony that I wanted could not come. And yet, as Reverend Jones has stated, the testimony is right here because he could tell us from the grave, may the works I've done Speak to me. May the works I've done speak for me. When I'm resting in my grave, there's nothing more to be said. May the works I've done let them speak for me. On the day that my brother passed, transition from labor to reward, there were 2,777 people in this country that passed from the same disease. Now, I don't know about the 2,776, but I do know about this one. This one loved the Lord. And when he closed his eyes in the sleep of death, 
I'm sure that he heard the trumpet sound. I'm sure that God's gates opened up and welcomed him. I'm sure that he was beginning to speak and talk to the other folk that have already passed on and gone on this way. But I know one thing. William, though he might have wanted to see his mother and father, though he might have wanted to see some of his other brothers and sisters and his uncles and aunts, I know one thing, that, G that he wanted to see Jesus, <laughs> the man who died for him. Jesus, the man who set him free. Jesus, the man who paved the way so that you and I, when we go this way, we have a right to the tree of life. Amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. We turn services back over to the hands of the mortuary. to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, looking for the resurrection, general resurrection and life in the world to come through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I heard a voice from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, even so saith the Spirit, for they shall rest from their labors. At this time we have prayer by Reverend Vance Jones.
to the family. We established this in your home, once you know we need it in honor to be able to serve you. We hope that we have lived up to your expectations. And if there's anything you need in the weeks and months to come, we are here for you. Just give us a call. We're here. We can help you in any kind of way. Again, on behalf of the family, I thank everybody for being here. As the family leaves the right side today, they're going to take a flower and place it on top of the casket. And we ask that you please allow the family to get to their vehicles that they may get home and get out of the coldness and be able to relax from a busy time, a stressful time going on. Again, we thank you and we say God bless you all with traveling mercies as you go to and from your destination. God bless.